Yeah, so some of you missed the first few minutes. Okay, so neuro-ophthalmology. This is a very interesting, one of my favorite areas of neurology. Um, and we're just going to only talk about these first two. I wanted to do something on the pupils, but it's just, I think, uh, too much information here. We don't have enough time. So we're going to focus on visual loss from the retina all the way back to the occipital lobe. Okay, um, we already uh, gave you a big picture of that during the neurology examination last year, but this will be more detailed. And then we will talk about um, loss of visual function that can occur. So not loss of visual acuity, visual fields, and all of that, but 50% of the brain is dedicated to processing vision. And we're going to talk about um, what can be involved there if we have lesions. Okay, so when we have visual loss as a big picture, we want to put it into, if we have visual field deficit in three categories, lesions anterior to the chiasm, lesions at the chiasm, and lesions posterior to the chiasm. Okay, so if we have a lesion here anterior to the chiasm, we're always going to have monocular vision loss. Okay, so left optic nerve or retinal lesion, the patient will have uh, blindness or some degree of visual loss um, just in that eye. Okay. Last year, we talked about the retina as a nasal retina and a temporal retina and where those fibers cross. And so um, I'm not going to go over that here in this lecture, but if this doesn't make sense, I would just go back and remind yourself how that works. But remember, if we have a lesion right here in the middle of the chiasm, um, that affects these crossing nasal retinal fibers. What does the nasal retina see? It sees the temporal visual field. And so the patient then will have a bitemporal hemianopia. They, they can't see the outer parts of vision in either eye. So this only happens with a lesion of the chiasm. Okay, as we move back to the optic tract from our uh, recent lecture on the stroke. On stroke, remember that the visual fibers are rotating in the optic tract. They're not settled, fixed in position. And so lesions here tend to give us a contralateral incongruous homonymous hemianopia. So if you see something there, it's not identical side to side. The lesion is going to be a little closer um, to the chiasm. The further we get back here, once we're into the optic radiations, the visual field deficits tend to be identical from side to side. Okay, so remember the anterior choroidal artery supplies this and also the lateral geniculate. Okay, and so if we have uh, a stroke of the optic tract, it's going to look a little bit more like this. If it more tends to involve the lateral geniculate, um, and then if we just look at the vascular supply here of the, this is the lateral geniculate. So we've got the anterior choroidal artery that supplies the outer parts, posterior choroidal artery here that supplies the middle. And so the more common anterior choroidal artery stroke, we get this uh, central beak-like zone of preserved vision right there. Okay, so remember anterior choroidal stro uh, stroke, patients have a hemiplegia, hemisensory loss. You might think it's an MCA stroke but then they have this distinctive visual loss pattern, okay? And they don't have all the other things you'd expect with an MCA stroke. They don't have an aphasia and, and all of that. Um, okay, posterior choroidal artery strokes are really rare, um, but if that happened, you'd have a little, just a little central loss of vision um, like that. Okay, now from the lateral geniculate, the optic radiations fan out over a huge distribution in the temporal and parietal lobe. And so the fibers that go through the temporal lobe, this is called uh, Meyer's loop here. And so if we have a lesion there, it tends to be less than a full quadrant. Okay, a little pie, uh, slice of pie here, quadr uh, superior quadrant anopsia, but uh, it's, it's not complete. Okay, so if you see that, the lesion has to be in the opposite temporal lobe. Okay, so here the lesion is on the left, and as the patient looks at the screen, the visual field defect is on the right um, here in each eye. And notice how the visual field def defect here is perfectly symmetrical in each eye. So um, again, once we get behind the chiasm, our defects will be the same. Whereas if we have a lesion uh, further up in the parietal lobe, now it tends to be a little bigger than a quadrant. Okay, because there's just more 
uh, optic radiations that travel through the parietal lobe. So it'll look like this, a kind of an inferior quadrantinopsia. And as we move back to the occipital lobe, um, everything is reversed in terms of vision. So the upper part of the occipital lobe sees the lower uh, visual fields. And so if we had a stroke, let's say, that just involved the more the superior occipital lobe, um, then we'd get uh, an inferior quadrantinopsia. Okay, and so anytime you see macular sparing like this, there has to be a PCA stroke. So this is a PCA stroke that just affected the more superior portion, whereas if we have an inferior bank occipital lobe lesion, then it's going to be the superior quadrant and, again, preserved uh, macular uh, fibers. Okay, and if we have the entire PCA territory knocked out in the occipital lobe, then we'll get a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia um, and, again, with the preserved macular vision. Okay, it's the only thing that does that, PCA stroke. Okay, so again, the anatomy here is optic nerve, chiasm. There's the pituitary gland or the pituitary stalk right there. Okay, there's the optic tract. Okay, and hopefully you recognize the lateral geniculate body. Remember the Napoleon's hat right there. And so there's a pathway going into the lateral geniculate, so this has to be the optic tract. Okay, and then from the lateral geniculate, we have the optic radiations um, here going back uh, to the occipital lobe and striate cortex back here, primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. Okay, so now let's do the whole thing over again, but in uh, more detail in terms of conditions um, that can cause this. So starting with um, anterior to the chiasm, let's start with retinal vascular diseases. So the ophthalmic artery is the first branch off of the internal carotid artery. Okay, and off of the ophthalmic, we have two very important branches here. The uh, central retinal artery, which we can see travels right through the optic nerve to supply the retina. Okay, and also off the ophthalmic artery, artery we have the posterior ciliary arteries. And here's another posterior ciliary artery. Okay, and this supplies the optic nerve Okay, and we'll talk about this very complex supply here of the optic nerve head by branches off of the posterior um, ciliary artery. All right, but um, first let's talk about occlusion of the central retinal artery. So if we occlude this blood vessel, then ischemia is going to be not to the optic nerve, the optic nerve head, but to the retina. So it's retinal ischemia. And so these patients have painless monocular vision loss a stroke, so it comes on suddenly, okay? And uh, there's a lot to know about the ophthalmology of this, which is, I think, beyond what you need to know right now, but there are a few things. Um, anytime we have um, a lesion here, optic nerve, optic nerve head, retina, um, our objective finding, one of them is an afferent pupillary defect. Okay, so remember, you bring that out with a swinging flashlight. When you go back to the bad eye, um, the pupil dilates. So that's an objective finding. And the other, and I would say really high yield for boards, would be a cherry red spot when you look in the eye. Okay, why do they have a cherry red spot? Well, you have diffuse retinal ischemia, right? So the retina actually takes on a very pale appearance because of the um, ischemia. But the fovea jumps out at you here. Okay, that's the cherry red spot. And so the reason they get a cherry red spot, so let me just show you, here's the central retinal artery supplying the retina. The, the, notice that the posterior ciliary artery here supplies the choroid, the vascular uh, portion here. And so the, um, the retinal layer over the fovea is extremely thin. All right, and so if we have diffuse retinal ischemia, uh, what happens is you can see the, the vascular choroid very well here through the fovea in a patient with diffuse retinal ischemia. So uh, that vascularity um, kind of stands out, and that's, that's what's referred to as the cherry red spot. So we'd like to see that to uh, support our diagnosis of a central retinal artery occlusion. If we contrast that with occlusion of the ophthalmic artery, okay, now we're going to have diffuse retinal ischemia, but you also have a loss of blood flow 
flow to the posterior ciliary artery, which includes supplying the choroid. And so in an ophthalmic artery occlusion, we have a patient with blindness, uh, but they're, they're not going to have the cherry red spot. Okay, that's central retinal artery occlusion. Um, amaurosis fugax, remember, is uh, retinal emboli from the carotid artery. Okay, and so the patients have uh, that kind of painless cloud that covers the eye or like a curtain pulled down, but it's a TIA, so the clot breaks up and vision is restored. So just remember again, order a carotid ultrasound if you get that story. <coughs> okay, so we have um, retinal involvement and now we can move back here to the optic nerve. So what can affect the optic nerve that would cause visual loss? Um, first we'll talk about is increased intracranial pressure. And uh, just notice here that, um, see this yellow space right here. Um, this is subarachnoid space, which you can see kind of coats the optic nerve and it goes right forward to the optic nerve head. And so the, the brain is in an enclosed skull, so when there's increased intracranial pressure, uh, there's just nowhere for that to go. The brain can herniate um, or the, and or the pressure can go forward to the optic nerve head. So increased pressure is going to uh, compress all of this right up to the optic nerve head. And this um, disrupts axoplasmic flow. We get swelling of the axons. They leak fluids out. And then when you look in the eye, you see a reflection of that. You see papilledema. So increased intracranial pressure that causes papilledema, it's 99.9% .9 of the time bilateral. So you would never see, with one rare exception, papilledema in one eye. It's going to be in both eyes. And so causes of increased intracranial pressure, I think fairly obvious if you have a big mass, a brain tumor, um, you know, anything with a lot of swelling, hydrocephalus. Uh, we talked about um, cerebral venous uh, thrombosis, okay, where the uh, arterial blood can't drain, so pressure builds up. We talked about in, uh, increased uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. So these would be some common causes of increased intracranial pressure with the objective finding of papilledema. Oops. So um, again, here's just showing you kind of the normal in blue, the cerebral spinal uh, space, subarachnoid space, which is normally very thin, but if you've got increased pressure, that pushes itself forward, okay, right up here to the optic nerve head and against the optic nerve. And we can actually visualize this on an MRI scan. And so here, um, if you order an MRI of the orbits, and they do very careful thin sections through the orbits. Um, so here's the optic nerve right here and the optic nerve head. And so the black space right here, this is actually the subarachnoid space, which is really enlarged here. This would indicate, uh, again, increased pressure moving forward um, against the optic nerve. You can see that on both sides. So uh, what does the patient complain of that has papilledema? Uh, remember when we talked about pseudotumor, I told you that uh, when you patients bend over or move their head, that shifting pressure around the optic nerve head causes brief episodes of blindness. So that's quite characteristic. Um, if you have someone with increased intracranial pressure, um, you know, they may be confused and sleepy because of that. And a classic eye finding is a bilateral six nerve palsy. Okay, we've already talked about that. Six nerve is especially susceptible to damage from increased intracranial pressure. Okay, you look in the eye and you see papilledema. Okay, and here's what happens to the vision um, in papilledema. You actually get a constriction of visual fields, like tunnel vision. Things kind of shrink, shrink down a little bit. And here's the blind spot right here, which is normally very small and uh, with increased intracranial pressure, uh, you would get an enlargement of the blind spot. Okay, tunnel vision, there is a very small list of things that actually cause tunnel vision. Um, this would be the most common, well, I don't know, tunnel vision very often is a psychogenic kind of a thing. So if, if you see a patient that says, I can only see about like this and they can't see anything out around here, if their eye exam is normal, then it's probably psychogenic. Um, 
And it's an interesting area of neurology. I wish we had more time to talk about it, but we can figure these things out usually very well. Um, well, since I brought it up, I'll just tell you the one example. If you have a patient with constricted vision like this, and so you, you know they can't see anything out here until you get right to a center area. Now, if this is due to something like papilledema, when you back up from the patient, um, that hole is going to enlarge, right? And so they'll be able to see a, a larger area as you back away from the patient. Generally, if it's psychogenic, it's going to stay like this no matter how far away from the patient you move. So if the tunnel stays the same, then that's what we would call a non-genuine uh, finding, psychogenic. Okay, so if we have papilledema, always, remember, never go straight to a lumbar puncture. You don't want to cause herniation. So we do an MRI, we do an MR venogram to look for venous uh, stenosis, and if it looks like we're dealing with idiopathic intracranial hypertension slash pseudotumor, then we do a lumbar puncture. Okay, so nice drawing. In the fourth year, you can do a two-week elective with me if you're interested in drawing pictures. So <laughs> student just uh, did this for me recently, showing you a nice example of a six-nerve palsy, which you might not see a lot if it's bilateral when the patient's looking forward. But notice when the patient here looks uh, to the right, the right eye does an AB duct. When the patient looks to the left, the left eye does an AB duct. So if you see a bilateral six-nerve palsy, that should be a big red flag of increased intracranial pressure. All right, optic neuritis, we've talked about uh, quite a bit here in this course. So just to remind you here, put it in this category, optic nerve. So the inflammation of optic neuritis is almost always the posterior part of the optic nerve. And that's very important because if the lesion is way back there, then when you look in the eye acutely, you don't see anything. Okay, so the rule of thumb with optic neuritis is the patient sees nothing and you see nothing. You see nothing abnormal. Okay, and so... Um, if we have lesions further up, closer to the optic nerve head, then you can actually see something abnormal uh, when you look in the eye. And so the visual loss of optic neuritis tends to be a central scotoma, and so that's why they do very poor with uh, visual acuity testing, because they've got a big black hole in the center um, of their vision. Usually color vision, this is often one of the earliest things. Um, I just saw a patient who had optic neuritis, and First thing she noticed is playing tennis. Everything suddenly became black and white in her right eye. So dyschromatopsia or loss of uh, color vision is common. And again, with any lesion anterior to the optic chiasm, you've got that afferent pupillary defect as another objective finding. Okay, and over time, remember that atrophy of the optic nerve leads to optic nerve pallor. We've got this kind of white appearance here of the um, optic nerve head, but you're not going to see that acutely, of course. Okay, so here's a common condition important to uh, be aware of. We can have um, two types of ischemia of the optic nerve. This one's much more common called um, non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. We have an arteritic and a non-arteritic form. Non-arteritic mean it's, it's not a vasculitis. Okay, this is a stroke, so just think of your typical patient that has diabetes, hypertension, and who smokes would be at risk for this. And so here the ischemia tends to be very anterior, usually right here um, at this area where all the posterior ciliary, ciliary branches supply the optic nerve head. And we call this anastomosis, the circle of Zinn Holler. Okay, so the ischemia is right there. So that means you have an abnormal eye exam when you look at the eye in these patients. Um, these usually happen out of sleep, probably because the blood pressure goes low during sleep, and especially if patients have sleep apnea, which is extremely common um, in this kind of patient population. So they have a little hypoxia, and so they have ischemia at the optic nerve head. So it's a, just a loss of the autoregulation of uh, vascular supply at the optic nerve head. So patients wake up with visual loss in one eye, and here's the really unique thing. This is what's been most helpful for me clinically to suggest this is diagnosis. It's altitudinal, okay? And, and in this case, it's the inferior quadrants that are affected um, predominantly. And so the, the visual loss is very often looks like this. And why is it the inferior quadrants? Well, there's a watershed area that supplies the optic nerve head. And so this is uh, the more susceptible area. Now they could have blindness of the whole eye, 
that if it's just the inferior quadrants like this in one eye, then this is your diagnosis, almost certainly. Okay, so um, we've got the non-arteritic form and the arteritic form, which you already know about, which is giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis. So again, this is a vasculitis, so they have systemic features. Uh, remember, these patients have polymyalgia my rheumatica, diffuse achy pains. It's older individuals, almost exclusively. Okay, and so they can have a variety of visual field loss. It sometimes could be altitudinal, but they have other symptoms. Remember, jaw claudication um, and uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. And the big risk, again, with these patients is that they can go blind in both eyes. So, and just kind of a rule of thumb, if you have an older individual who's just, you know, acutely losing vision in both eyes, this is most likely your diagnosis, giant cell arteritis. Okay, one other optic neuropathy here I think worth worthwhile knowing about. Uh, Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy. Interestingly, the first human disease linked to mitochondrial DNA. So you look for a family history where mitochondria are maternally transmitted. Um, and so uh, affected individuals are younger men. And so it usually starts in one eye with visual loss and then just, you know, devastating within weeks or months than the other eye is uh, involved as well. So they lose vision in both eyes. Okay, so I won't say a lot about this condition. If you go into ophthalmology or neurology, there's, there's a lot more to say, obviously. But um, if we do diagnose a man with Leber's optic neuropathy, because the mitochondrial are maternally passed, you, you can at least say there's no chance of this being passed on. Okay, and even if, so we can check for a genetic mutation in this condition, but even if you have it, um, this doesn't mean that you're going to get the condition. So more than 50% of men with the mutation, more than 85% of women never develop visual loss. <coughs> so of course you wouldn't want to have that mutation, but it, it's not like Huntington's disease, where if you've got those trinucleotide repeats, you will get Huntington's disease. Okay, the optic chiasm. There is a mnemonic here for remembering lesions around the optic chiasm called SACHMO. And I've just highlighted the ones taken out a bunch that I'd like you to know for now. The, I think the only one you know for sure right now is a cellar tumor, pituitary adenoma. All right, so you know that tumor, I think from last year, compresses the chiasm. You get the bitemporal visual field loss. But the internal carotid artery is right close to the optic chiasm. So if we have an aneurysm there, that can certainly grow to compress on the chiasm or when it ruptures could even potentially affect the chiasm. Um, Dr. Deich mentioned craniopharyngiomas that come from Rathke's pouch. So we usually see these on a scan um, in children uh, that are in this area as well and could potentially involve the optic chiasm. Okay. We can also have a number of tumors that can grow around the optic chiasm. A meningiomas, this is a common place for meningiomas to grow, or metastatic tumors, okay? And uh, optic nerve gliomas can sometimes, they tend to grow backwards. So they start around the optic nerve, but they extend back um, to the optic chiasm. Now, one thing you will get used to if you look at enough brain scans over time, MRI is so sensitive, we often find a little cyst or something small around the optic chiasm. Those are usually just incidental um, findings. We call them an incidental loma. Okay, but uh, <laughs> obviously if the patient has visual loss, then you know, that would be concerning. So it's a bitemporal hemianopsia. So you know about pituitary tumors and their relationship to the optic chiasm. Okay, but also if we look here, here's the optic chiasm. Um, notice that the internal carotid artery is pretty close. Okay, so again, an aneurysm um, could affect that. And of course, the pituitary is, is even closer. Okay, here's a child with a mass right here in this area. Okay, here's the pituitary. And we've got this mass. This is a craniopharyngioma. Okay, if we move back to the optic radiations, um, we've already talked about an MCA stroke. The MCA supplies the optic radiation. So if we've got a complete MCA stroke, the patient will have, have a complete contralateral 
homonymous hemianopsia. Uh, if we have any other mass or tumor in the optic radiations, we know, let's say we have a temporal lobe tumor, then they're going to have that pie in the sky visual deficit. Okay, but a couple of other things. So in the last lecture of this course, I'm going to tell you about progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So I'll just mention it quickly here, mainly to say that PML um, tends to involve the optic radiations. That's often the first manifestation of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So I told you that this occurs with this MS medication, natalizumab. <coughs> That's important to remember. And it's also uh, something that we'll see in patients that have AIDS. Okay, so the first symptom of PML tends to be visual loss. So if, so if it's one side um, like this, affecting the optic radiations, and th this patient is going to have progressive uh, contralateral visual field deficit. Um, here they did a biopsy to try to figure out what's going on there. Okay, now here's a new condition we haven't talked about, but uh, we actually see this not infrequently. Um, it's called PRESS syndrome. Um, and so this occurs from extremely high blood pressure, and it's mainly related to if a patient has a, a spike of blood pressure. So these are often patients that have maybe poorly controlled hypertension, and for whatever reason, their blood pressure just really hits a, a spike. And so you lose um, autoregulation of uh, blood supply, and so you get swelling and edema that tends to be in the area of the optic radiations. So if you have altered autoregulation, endothelial dysfunction, disrupts the blood-brain barrier, and the brain swells. Um, we don't tend to see this cortically because the cortical neurons are really packed tightly together. This is more of something you'd likely see in the white matter. And so the causes are poorly controlled hypertension, um, we'll see this in um, eclampsia. And one medication uh, worthwhile to know that's highly associated with this is cyclosporin. So we want to be kind of primed for that if a patient is on that uh, medication. So the clinical presentation, they've got all this swelling, right, from the high blood pressure. So these patients have severe headaches. And because of all of the, I mean, just look at all the swelling here in the brain. But it, look, it does tend to be more posterior. And so these patients are confused because they've got some increased intracranial pressure. We can see even the lateral ventricle here is kind of getting compressed um, here by the swelling. We can see that some of the edema here is extending out, potentially involving some of the cortex. And so these patients may have seizures. But if the, if the patient is awake enough that you're able to do a good exam, because of so much involvement of the optic radiations, they have visual loss, and this is, can be severe to the point that they can be uh, completely blind from knocking out the optic radiations. And interestingly, and this is probably kind of an overlap of the, that right hemisphere phenomenon we were talking about with the right MCA stroke, where they have denial of illness, um, that if we have big lesion back here, probably more right hemisphere will give us a denial of the visual loss. And we call that Anton syndrome, when it's just... A uh, patient is blind, but they deny that they're blind. And so we have to watch these patients very carefully. They will try to get up and do things and walk around and unaware that they can't see. Okay. This is actually a very rewarding condition to treat because you bring, a, bring the blood pressure down and this swelling goes away almost immediately. And so these patients, the vision comes back. You stop the cyclosporin if they're on that and uh, good recovery in general. All right, moving back to the occipital lobe, uh, we've kind of um, hammered PCA strokes with macular sparing, I think enough. But let me just say one thing about vision back here. The tip of the occipital lobe is where uh, macular vision is located at. And so if we have head trauma that involves, you know, maybe the, the head is hit back on something, um, then you can have swelling right back here at the tip of the occipital lobe. And that will actually result, if it's on both sides, in kind of a bilateral central macular uh, visual loss. So if we see a patient that kind of looks like a bilateral central scotoma, um, you know, multiple sclerosis would be very unlikely to affect both eyes at the same time. So we actually want to think about um, some trauma here affecting the occipital lobe. Okay, here's a patient that had head trauma. 
and just got the tip of the right occipital lobe. And so they actually just affected the macular vision um, you know, in, in both eyes. So frequently we'll see this on both sides and then the patient will lose all of macular or central vision. Okay, now this part I just find fascinating. Again, half of the brain is involved in not just getting the information back to the occipital lobe, but what happens to it once it gets back there. Okay, we've already said you don't read in the occipital lobe, you read in Wernicke's area. And so that's just one example of areas of the brain that are involved in interpreting and uh, processing visual information. So let's say just a little bit about loss of visual function. Uh, one example I've given you of that is alexia without agraphia. Okay, that, remember that's with the left PCA stroke where the patient is unable to read because they can't get the vision from the right occipital lobe to Wernicke's area. Okay, that would be one example. Now, just relax on this. You actually don't need to know this, okay? But it, I wanna, it's hard to communicate this with at least telling you how vision uh, gets back to the occipital lobe in terms of function. So there are basically two pathways. Um, one is involved with the what of information and the other is involved with the where of information. So the what means, you know, what is it? Whose face is that? What is it that I'm looking at? The occipital lobe does not interpret what you see. That has to go to other parts of the brain. And so the what of vision is selectively sorted out as it goes back to the lateral geniculate and back to the uh, occipital lobe. There's a just select pathway for the what of vision. And there's also a separate pathway for the where of vision. So where are things in space? Um, tracking things. The occipital lobe, it gets that vision, but it doesn't help you to localize. It has to go to another part of the brain. And so, um, again, we have a what and a where that are actually segu uh, segregated in certain parts of the lateral geniculate, all in different layers. You don't need to know this, okay? But this is what I would like you to know, that once vision gets back to the occipital lobe, where does it go for the what and the where? Okay, so the what of information, what is it, goes from the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe on both sides. Okay, so our ability to look at a face that we haven't seen in a long time and right away you know who it is, that is involving communication between occipital and temporal lobe. You're continually laying down memories of the things that you see and that's the pathway that's involved. Okay, so when you see that face and you've got to pull up with the thousands and thousands of other faces that you know, the occipital lobe is then communicating with all of that stored information um, here in the temporal lobe. Okay, so this is the, the what of vision is what we call the P pathway projection. And so the what then is identification of, of faces, letters, symbols, objects, and also color processing. Okay, so uh, deficits in terms of visual function almost always have to be bilateral. So we've got a patient now with bilateral occipital temporal lesions. And remember that's where Meyer's loop travels. Okay, so if you have a, a bilateral lesion here affecting this kind of temporal occipital uh, connections, usually these patients will have, um, again, it's bilateral, so it's not just a quadrant, but a superior visual field um, deficit. Okay, and here was a patient I saw some time ago who had a clot in his basilar artery. And so acutely we saw ischemia here mainly on the right side. He actually had some on the left as well. And so we had kind of a disconnect of trying to get vision from the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, it's again, it's the what of vision. So they have what's known as a visual agnosia, which means they're terrible at identifying anything that they see. So you'll show them shapes and they're just not very good. Is it a rectangle or a square or a star or a circle? Um, and so, um, I think I might have mentioned this, but a, a patient I saw that was used car salesman, and I, we just went in, we showed him a bunch of vehicles, and you know, couldn't separate what's a Mercedes or a, a BMW. So that's a visual agnosia, okay? Um, the what also involves, again, recognizing faces. So if you have a bilateral lesion there, you get what's called prosopagnosia, and so these patients are horrible with facial recognition. Yes? 
Yeah, that's a good question. If you ask them to draw a rectangle or a circle, I suspect they'd do fairly well with that because that would be kind of processing that information in a different way. Yeah, kind of like Alexia without a graphia. So prosopagnosia, again, very interesting. Uh, you can ask these patients, um, like one patient that I saw recently was a big LA Lakers fan. And so he could tell me every Laker for the last 25 years. I mean, it was really amazing. And, uh, but we showed him pictures. You know, just bring out your iPhone. No idea, who's that? Didn't recognize Kobe Bryant. Okay, so um, again, it's the facial recognition. Patients I've seen with this, a follow-up in clinic, you know, the, the one man just very cute said, you know, I, I sure recognize your voice, but I'm sorry, you just don't look familiar. So the, the loss of facial recognition. Also remember, uh, color processing involves the occipital temporal connections. And so you'll show a patient some things with colors and they all just kind of have a gray appearance. Okay, so we get a dyschromatops dyschromatopsia, achromatopsia would be a complete loss of um, color vision. Okay. Any questions about the, uh, the what lesions? So remember visual agnosia, prosopagnosia, dyschromatopsia. Those would be the key features. Okay, now the other, uh, there are several areas, but just one other um, important information from the occipital lobe mainly goes to the parietal lobe on both sides, and this is for the where of vision. Okay, where are things located? Okay, and so this pathway then is obviously important for motion, spatial relationships. And just like with the disruption of the what pathway, the lesions usually need to be bilateral. You need to lock, knock out a lot of this to really have um, significant clinical deficits. So here is a patient, I think, who had the press syndrome. And so we can see some inflammation on both sides. This is higher up. This is the parietal lobe here. And so again, information from the occipital to the parietal lobe is going to be disrupted. Okay. So what happens if you disrupt the where pathway? And here we get a syndrome. It's called Balance syndrome. So this is usually bilateral parietal lobe lesions. And so one thing these patients have is optic ataxia. Okay, and remember on the exam, we do finger to nose testing to check cerebellar function. If the patient has ataxia, they kind of look like this doing the finger to nose testing. Okay, and optic ataxia, when you're moving your finger and the patient's reaching out to it, it looks pretty much the same. And we think, okay, this looks like a cerebellar ataxia lesion. Okay, but really the problem is they, they're just very poor localizing where things are in space. So following your finger and reaching out to it is very difficult. So how we separate this from uh, cerebellar ataxia is we now just ask the patient, could you touch your nose? And that doesn't require vision. So they're fine. They can do this. They can touch the shoulder. Very precise. If you have a patient with a cerebellar lesion, they're ataxic with any movement. So going back to their nose, or, you know, shaking back and forth. So with optic ataxia, it's purely reaching out to an object uh, where they will have the ataxia. That's why we call it optic ataxia. Um, another feature of it is called oculomotor apraxia. And this is a, just a fancy word to describe their very poor tracking things in space. Because again, they, they can't localize where things are in space very well. And oftentimes, as they just try to move their eyes from one side to the other, they have to close their eyes and try to force the eyes to kind of look in the other direction. So their tracking uh, is quite poor. And then this is just so interesting. Um, if you have lost the wear of vision, you know, it's amazing what we can do. We can just look at something and take in the whole scene in just a split second what's going on. If you have lost the wear of vision, these patients can't do that. So when they look at something, they can just focus maybe on one little thing here or one thing over here, but they can't take in everything. And so that is best described as a lack of global capture. Okay, the word simultagnosia is just describing that, a lack of global capture, a lack of ability to take in the whole scene. And so we have this very outdated picture here that neurologists have used for 50 years or more, and, but we carry this in a in our pocket the card and we'll show the patient what do you see in this picture okay and it doesn't take us long to see that 
the boy is about to get a subdural hematoma from <laughs> reaching over here, and the dishwater is overflowing, and, and all of that. But um, it's amazing. These patients will just say, it looks like someone's doing the dishes, or the boy is trying to get a cookie. You know, they just can't take in the whole scene. Okay, that's simultagnosia. Or you can show them these, um, you know, an A that is made out of E's, and they can't see the A. They can just say, I see an E. Okay, that's again simultagnosia. Or pull these up on your phone, these pictures where faces are made out of fruit or vegetables, and we can see the face. And if you show a patient with simultagnosia, they will say, I see an onion or something, but they can't put the whole thing um, together. Okay, so again, we won't do the pupils because um, I think that's enough here for neuro-ophthalmology. We might do a little bit at the end of the course in terms of review of Horner's and third nerve palsy and all of that. Okay, we'll see you next week.